driving back, before I even first spoke to my wife, I ended up finding my team captain first, um, saying to him, this is what's gone down. We've got two weeks, we've got to get another, get someone else in play, you know? So yeah, it was a, it was a total roller coaster ride that changed my whole way of thinking from going one second, you're thinking you're indestructible and you get faced minutes later, you get faced with your own mortality. Welcome to the Dark Zone, an event racing podcast. This is your host, Brian Gatens. In event racing lingo, a dark zone is a time when due to darkness or safety, teams are paused on the course before continuing with the race. During that time, stories are exchanged, friendships are kindled, spirits are restored, and teams have a chance to prepare for the next challenge. We hope that you make good use of this dark zone. We're glad that you're here. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you, the listeners, I started the Dark Zone as a personal project in July 2021, and over time, quite the community has grown around this little podcast. Your consistent feedback and support is appreciated, and it's been wonderful to hear of its impact on our sport. Today, we are joined by South African adventure racer Donovan Sims, a longtime member of Team Merrill. At this moment, he is racing in Expedition Africa Lesotho as a member of the Originals. All four members of his team are racing their 10th Expedition Africa. For today's episode, we talk about his transition from rugby to adventure racing, what he's learned about team dynamics, navigation, food, sleep, and about his diagnosis and recovery from leukemia. He's a powerful speaker, and thank you, Donovan, for being so open and honest about your challenges. Enjoy today's episode, and thank you, Don, for joining the Dark Zone in Adventure Racing Podcast. Welcome to the Dark Zone in Adventure Racing Podcast. Today, we are joined by Donovan Sims, who, besides having his first name be my wife's maiden name, is also one of the more accomplished adventure racers that we've seen around the world. Um, Donovan has raced primarily a lot of races in Africa. He's raced with Team Merrill Adventure Addicts. Donovan, thank you for coming on to the Dark Zone today. Tell us a bit about yourself, a bit about where you got your start in your adventure racing career. Brian, thanks uh, thanks so much for the interview and uh, and the invite and allowing me to be on the show. Um, Yeah, I started racing, my first race was 2003. I used to play rugby. Um, I think you guys call it football. And um, I stopped playing I stopped playing rugby and I had my first race three weeks after my last game. And that was me. I was hooked. Um, I bought my first bicycle after that race. And um, I, for, me, for me, I just love the whole thing of being out there, getting out there and just doing something off the charts. And um, the most exciting thing for me with, with this, this thing of advance racing is – so many times we'll bump into someone and they'll say, oh, you did this 500 kilometer race. It's amazing. I can't believe, you know, I could never do that. And I'm like, no, you can. Anyone can, you know. And um, I put my foot in it a few years ago. You mentioned I was raced with the uh, Merrill Adventure Addicts. Um, the lady that's handling the sponsorship for us, um, I've said to her once or twice before that um, anyone can anyone can do it. Anyone can do anything they set their mind to it. And I still, I joked her one day and I said to her that, um, give me three weeks and someone that is sort of fairly fit or semi-fit and I'll get them through an expedition race. And um, she put me, she put me on a spot in 20, <laughs> in 2017, I took a, sorry, 2018, I took a team of um, cancer survivors through uh, Expedition Africa in Namakwa and um, 500 k's later, we all four crossed the finish line. So that's what I love about the sport. It's possible for anyone. Eh? I, I agree with you. And you, you hear that time and time again, that people who have a moderate athletic background, that they, they dip their toe into the water, like you said, and they find that they enjoy it very much. Going yeah. back 19 years ago, when you transferred from your, your rugby playing into adventure racing, right? Uh, the, the, from the frying pan into the fire. What did you find that you were very good at in the beginning? What was some transfer from your previous athleticism that helped you when you started? That's a very that's a that's a difficult question because for me I absolutely loved everything. Um, the the team that I was with, it's the first time I really met the guys it was basically a week before the race. Um, so my cycling was clearly my weakness. I didn't even own a bicycle in my first race. But <laughs> I call that a weakness. The, the thing, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, the thing I could, the thing I could, um, I added to the team for, for, um, from our side was more my enthusiasm. And, um, you know, we, we were in, we were in a dark zone, we were in dark, dark places. And, um, yes, I was just, I was on, on a high. We raced for 52 hours that race. We never slept. 
in 52. I've still fed, a prize giving, I fell asleep in my plate of food. But I was on such a high during that race, the course of the race. I was, um, it, it was so difficult to come down. And a week later, we had those post-race blues. And I was, I was just, uh, you know, I, I talk about it now and I start getting all excited again. Clearly, as someone who played other team sports, you valued the, the idea of the team. Right. You know, I, I, I've been to a few rugby <laughs> matches. Right. And if everybody's not working in unison, the team mm-hmm. comes apart and you transferred that skill set into your adventure racing. And, and once you got a taste of it, you were just off to the races, literally and figuratively. Like you loved the idea of it, recognizing that. And we learn this all the time in adventure racing, that attitude will make up for lack of skill. Time and Absolutely. time again, right? You Because you came in as a positive teammate and you felt good about the team and the sport, it made up for your lack of even owning a bicycle. How did you How did you deal with the, the mental side of it when you knew you weren't that good at something, but yet you still felt worthy enough to go and do it? How did you How did you talk to yourself during those races? Because it's, it's hard for somebody to get into a race and having a low skill set and feel good about being there. What, what, what did you say to yourself? Well, the first race, obviously, I the race is going forward, especially when I was invited to join the Merrill Adventure Addicts. The scenario you're painting there now, I was very much there. Um, we, we always looked at um, the Merrill Adventure Addicts as um, this, this team that was out there. They were competing for the top positions the whole time. And then um, I got invited to come in. And from, from the first phone call from I decided that's it um i knew he gave me my, my first race with him was world champs in spain in 2010 and um, i had basically about two months to prepare and um just got myself into a position that from that first race with them my thinking was i will never be physically i will never be the weakest in the team so when it came to training and that sort of thing i threw everything to it um i, I work on the on the fresh produce market and um, so I'm up early in the morning. I'm up at three in the morning. I'm back home by about midday. I'd put in two training sessions a day and I'd, for the whole, my whole racing career, that, that has been my sort of, um, my thing is not to be the weakest, always to be the strongest in the team. And, um, and if I am lacking in a, in a, in a, uh, area of the race, be it um, experience or whatever the case may be, I'm, I'm happy to be the guy to, carry someone's bag or do something else. I have to add something, some, some sort of value to the team. And that's a very common thing we hear time and time again on the dark zone, that really good teammates, they don't compare themselves to their other teammates. They compare themselves to themselves and they say, what can I bring to the race? What can I do here? So you made a good point that while you may not be the best at any one thing, the ability to be strong, to carry gear, to be a good teammate, that's what you brought to the team. Yeah. <laughs> when you've been on a variety of teams, when do teams come apart? When do they fall apart? When does it not go well? Either you've experienced or you've seen on other teams. What what adds up to make it difficult for them? So I think a clash of personalities is a major issue. Um, I'm not sure if, if Heidi mentioned to you that um, Garth Pankey, a, a very good friend of mine, him and I joined Stefan and Heidi in an event. We raced together for about five years. Um, the four of us, Stefan, Heidi, myself, and Garth. And um, we always heard the stories of how they'd have issues in, in, in the, within their teams, you know, husband and wife. It's always easier to, to come down on your spouse, for, the, for, for example, than um, a friend or someone. And so when, when our team at that time, it was 2005, our team, uh, Garth and my team came apart and Stefan and Heidi's team came apart. And I phoned the race organizer to withdraw from um, the Bull of Africa in 2005. And a day later, he phoned me and said, listen, Stefan and Heidi were looking for someone. And um, anyway, so we met each other literally at the start of the race. And driving up to that race, um, Garth and I were saying, yeah, we've heard the stories about how things go come apart in their team, you know, with especially racing with husband and wife. So when we got to that, got to this first race with them, we basically made a team within a team. So I, I sort of attached myself onto Stefan and Garth onto Heidi. And um, so I looked after Stefan, he looked after me and same with Garth and Heidi. And that absolutely worked for us. And we raced, like I say, for five years together. We never had, I don't think we, we had a single issue in, in that team racing together. So 
um, when teams come apart, it's clash of personalities generally. And um, and uh, we, we're, uh, with the adventure addicts, you know, we'd um, I was a, I was always the backup nav. And if the navigator at some point made a mistake, we might be on the wrong ridge. When the realization hit, we've just wasted three hours or five hours to be on the wrong ridge. Let's turn around, go back and fix it. We had an understanding as well that there's no moaning, no bitching and complaining. Suck it up, cupcake, fix it and get back into the race. You know, So if we're all in the same mindset, there's no problem. That's a common thing in adventure racing that a lot of newcomers have to wrap their heads around. That adventure racing at any level, whether it be a local six, 10 hour race, whether it be a five day, 10 day, hundreds of kilometer race, everybody at some point during a race, every team makes a mistake at some point. It could be a massive error. It could be the wrong ridge. It could be hours. It could be a minor error, the wrong trail. And what teams do in that moment very often decides how the rest of the race goes, right? If they, if they, if they fight with each other, if they complain, if they moan to your point, things come apart and adventure racing in many ways, isn't about error avoidance. It's about error correction. I'm wrong. Exactly. I have to correct it. We have to correct it together as a team and off we go. You mentioned that you're a backup navigator. As backup navigator, because navigation obviously is, is, is a core skill you have to have, right? You could be as fit as you want. If you can't yeah. find your way around the map, it's upside down. As Stand backup up. nav, how heavily involved are you with the navigation? Do you follow along quietly behind or are you shoulder to shoulder with the navigator? So, um, if you are if you are following that and you're not involved in the nav, it's very difficult to take over. You say to me, Don, um, take the map for a while. I need I need a bit of a break. If as a backup nav, if you haven't been aware of where you are on the map, it's very difficult to suddenly get the map after a day off or two day race, and he goes, "Are we here? You know, keep us going." So it's very important to stay involved. So when we come into a transition and um, we need to plot the maps or mark the course as we're going. The two navigators will be will be doing that together, while the other teammates will be doing something of feeding the guys or c- getting the kit yeah, ready, getting bikes but, ready, um, things like that. It, yeah, and then as soon as as soon as the the navving is done, then we get get together and do it. But if there are two navs in the team, those two navs need to need to be on each other's shoulders. So Stefan and I, when I, Stefan and, and Heidi, um, Stefan and I, we nav together, and then with the um, Merrill Adventure Addicts, then it was Graham Bird and myself. And we work together that way. And then um, yeah, it just works, you know, having one nav in the team and everyone, all the pressure being on that one person, it's uh, it's not fair. It's very difficult for him to be focused and in it from the start to the finish. When you're doing a big race and you're given five, six, seven, eight, ten maps, depending on the time you have, there's only so much you can really do. Do you attempt to navigate out the, plot out the entire race at one time? Or do you say to yourself, the first section, the first two, three sections, I'm going to figure out, and then I'll worry about that later on. Or do you try to get an understanding of the whole course right away? And I bring that question up because very often newer racers, they feel overwhelmed by the amount of maps and the distance and the time, and they're stuck. Do they do they figure it all out or they do it piecemeal? What strategy do you yeah. use? So in the beginning, when, when we, like I say, from about 2005, my first 500-kilometer um, race, I remember, I think we were handed out something close to like 17 maps, um, one is to 50,000 maps. And that evening we sat and we plotted, we we put the whole map, the whole course out. So we had an idea of where we're going. But over the years, what I find works for me, um, I nav within checkpoint to checkpoint. So if um, the way things are, the way things go generally nowadays is you don't get given the full course. They will give you... um, maps for say leg one, two, and three, and then, and so on, you're moving through. So I will, I will plot leg one. Um, and in leg one, there might be several checkpoints. And for me at that time, when I move from checkpoint three to checkpoint four, that is the most important part of that map. I can't find myself thinking about what's coming ahead or what's a, I need to get my team from to there, find the checkpoint, move on to the next checkpoint. And so I like to split for, my, for naving for me, I like to split the race up into little bites from uh, checkpoint to checkpoint. Obviously, if, um, if there are things in place, like a uh, big water, water section that there might be big rapids and we'd have um, dark zones in play, so you'd be chasing or we can tap off. We're never going to make the dark zone, r- race a bit slower, so then you'll be thinking ahead. But if that's not not happening, not in play, then yeah, checkpoint to checkpoint, that works for me. 
During your races, what is your sleep strategy? Are you a go through the first whole day and sleep the next night? Do you try to sleep within 24 hours? Do you not sleep? How do you, how do you work on that? Um, most importantly for me is never to waste daylight hours. You know, so if, um, if I can go through, if I can go through the first day without sleep, as long as we're not, we never sleep in the daytime. <laughs> you know, you can, we can go for, I don't know, sometimes 38 or, or you know, 40 hours, depending what time the race starts. But never daytime. You know, we get sun go if you if team's exhausted, sleep. Um, in the ideal world, I would I would always pick my sleep strategy from around about two in the morning. So I call it that bewitching hour when the sleep monsters really start to take yeah. charge. It's amazing. It's amazing how from two to five AM, that three hour window, yeah, before you begin to see hopefully you begin to see some sunlight coming up. It is dark and it is cold. And, and so to your point. You kill that time that if you're going to sleep, it's during that time. It's you're going to make it. You're yes. going to you're going to you're going to get through there. As soon as that sun comes up, as tired as you are, or your teammates to be tired. As soon as that sun comes up, it's a, it's a game changer. Everyone's got a bit of a better laugh, and we're moving forward. That's true, true, yeah. And, and you know the old expression, like when you're when you're really in a, in a tough, tough place. Don't make any decisions at two o'clock in the morning. And also the same thing in a, in a transition area. Make no decisions there. Like just get out and keep moving. If, um, again, if we're in a transition area and it's two in the morning, um, we've got food, there's, we've got water, we'll generally have more clothing. So if you're going to sleep, that's where you sleep. Get to tra- If it's a quiet transition. Right. We raced in Rodrigues in, um, I think it was 20, 2019. Coming into the transition, my idea with my team was to um, – sleep there we got there and there were a bunch of people there it was noisy and i said to the guys no ways we can't sleep it, it was dark i think it was around about maybe eight in the evening and um we had to the next checkpoint was an island offshore and um we got on we got in our boat and um we rode in the dark i took i took um back bearings and bearings with with landmarks behind us in the dark and lights and so on and i know my team there was a lot of um they were very skeptical about that because we couldn't see where we were going. We were just paddling into the darkness. But isn't that a wild feeling? Because we've all been there, right? Like you're, it's dark, it's night, and you're just setting off into the darkness, whether on foot or by bicycle or by boat. Isn't that an amazing feeling when that happens? It, it, I'm, I get goosey thinking back. I mean, this is paddling onto the ocean. We're just paddling into the darkness. And the, um, the big my, unknown. So That's that, amazing. Uh, my my one of the team members in our team was a guy by the name of Dave Palmer. He's he is um Merrill. He he's our main key sponsor. And um so it's his first adventure race and having him on the boat and just going to the doctors. I remember he was <laughs> <laughs> big role. By the way, Donovan, big role. Don't don't kill the sponsor. Big role. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and um, I remember when we saw the outline of the island, um, uh, the relief for myself. Obviously, I didn't show that to my team. I mean, I knew exactly where I was going. <laughs> but uh, so to, to get to a quiet, very important. if you're going to rest, you need to rest. You know, you can't be lying there, tossing and turning, listening to stuff. You're so exhausted at that point. You need to make the, make your sleep time count. Uh, yeah, very common transition areas are just terrible places to sleep. I, I've, I've, I've tried and it's been a rotten idea. And so don't do that. How about your food? What do you eat during a race? Are you a real food guy? Are you a packaged food guy? Are you eat everything? Like, what do you like? I, I like solid food. Um, so your first day or two of the race, it's quite easy. You know, you can, you can pack some buns and that sort of thing. My wife makes a killer chicken and mayo sami. So um, she'll, she'll, we'll have some chicken and mayo put in um, containers in our, in our um, eggs, some ice. Um, but uh, we do a lot of things like in South Africa, we call it dry sausage or drove horse. Um, I think it's similar to beef jerky. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I like a lot of that sort of thing. I don't really race too much on sugars, um, but the, um, I do do the packaged food as well. You know, I mean, transition, if it's hot water or something like that, but solid food. So that's something that's going to fill me up. Um, I find if I'm racing on bars and gels and that kind of stuff, especially on the longer races, the shorter races, you can get away, away with it. Mm-hmm. But those longer races, your energy sparks, your sugar sparks ups and downs. They don't work for me. Are you a coffee drinker? I love coffee. Um, I'm addicted to coffee. I love coffee. So if, if there's coffee available in a transition or if we're going through a little town and there's a coffee shop, I would love a cup of coffee. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's funny you mentioned the coffee shop. That's one of the um, the uh, items of adventure racing that really throws a lot of newer racers off. The fact that if you're racing through a town, feel free to pull over 
get a bite to eat, buy some stuff in a store and get back on the course. Cause that's very, un- exactly. you don't do that like in a marathon or in a, in a road race. Like you're not allowed to walk off the course. Not that I haven't done that, but you're not allowed to do that during a race. <laughs> no, no. With, with adventure racing, we, um, my first uh, experience of, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, an espresso. We mm-hmm. raced in Portugal. I was racing with team Sanosis at the time, 2007. And, um, we came into this, it was a hotel, the, the transition was a hotel and it was cold and it was wet. And um, so in our very broken Spanish or Portuguese, we tried to, we said we'd like to buy some coffee. Anyway, so these four little cups come out to us, little espressos, and I'm like, seriously, you know, what, what is this thing? I put it down, the back of my neck stood up. It was, it was like <laughs> liquid, pure uh, Caffeine, but the boost of note, it was unbelievable. So, but yeah, yeah, different, uh, d- different, uh, different races, different courses. It's amazing. So, so you, you've raced, you've raced in a lot of places, right? I've, I've, you've ticked off Portugal. I know you've raced in Swaziland, Tasmania, Africa, 18, 19 years of adventure racing experience. Very often this question is hard because it's like, you're trying to eat an elephant, right? It's a big question. When you look back on those races, what place really jumped out to you as being an experience that was just, it's just stuck in your brain? One of those kind of races that you mentioned, you know, it has to be Tasmania. Um, it was a, it was a beautiful course. Um, we did a, we did a, my first 500k race with Stefan and Heidi was on our, uh, what we in South Africa call Richtersfeld, which is on the West coast of Africa. So obviously uh, I think that 500k race like that was um, my first big one was, was special. You know, so a lot, a lot of that sits in, in the back of my head all the time and I often go back to it. But um, as, as a course layout that Tasmania, uh, the race in Tasmania was superb. Um, Ecuador was magnificent. Um, we raced in, in two, 2015, we raced world champs in um, Pantanal. I mean, we had a hiking leg there, I think, I can the correction, I think the hiking leg was maybe 60 kilometers, of which we were literally from our ankle or chest deep in water. It's crystal clean water, and it was, so it's very difficult um, to single out one race. But um, yeah, I think if I have to, Tasmania would be that race. It was, it was just a, a beautiful race for me. Yeah, and and Tasmania, not unlike New Zealand, any of those countries that are sort of cut away from the rest of the world by water, very often the ecosystems and the animals and the the, the fauna and the flora are just amazing, right? You're, it's not like you, we get used to where we live, and then all of a sudden yeah. you're, you're, it's like you're dropped into a magical land. So I so I can relate to that very very much. Yeah, lot, victories, a lot of, a lot of wins out there for you, a lot of a lot of podiums. Um, talk a bit about your the the success you've had on the race course. Racing with Stefan and Heidi, we were always competitive. Um, you know, we we didn't have we, by the 2005 500k race and the 2008 500k race, we didn't. There were no, there weren't um, regular 500k expedition races that we were racing with. Um, but we we had a few um, podiums with those with the, the 200s and 300k races. And then when I when I came from 2010 with um, the Merrill Adventure Addicts. Um, that's when things sort of heating up a bit for us. So um, I think we had the first two or three uh, Expedition Africas. We had, uh, we had podiums there. And then um, in 2015, it was a very special race for me. I, I, got, I got ill and um, so I went the whole chemo in 20, 2014. And six months later, winning at Swaziland, that was – it was an unbelievable win because we had a very slow start. Um, one of our team members got a bit ill in the beginning from heat, and we came back and there was a there was a dark zone for for, for a paddle leg. And when all the team set off, all the teams that were at the dark zone, when they set off the next morning, it was like a new race for us. We had had sleep, and it was. And I remember we at the very last at the second last checkpoint, we bumped into Team Estonia. We had a lead on them. We made a nav error and they caught us at the second last checkpoint. And we literally ran on foot down a mountain. We could see from the top of the mountain, we could see the, the hotel, which was the finish. And there was a checkpoint on a gate, on a fence. We're dealing with a one inch 50,000 man. So we're running down a, down a mountain. They went slightly left. We went slightly right. Both the, same, both the right route, just not, we didn't know which was which. And I remember getting the checkpoint and running the last 200 meters into the into the hotel, 
into the hotel grounds, not knowing. Obviously, everyone was cheering. There were there was a lot of spectators, but people cheer for first place or second place or last place. So running in, we had no idea. Uh, only until we crossed the finish, we realized we actually won that race. And uh, that was a very special race for me, you know, for, for all sorts of reasons. Well, I had, I had, I had heard about your, your, your leukemia diagnosis and thank God you're okay. We're, we're, we're going eight, eight years now. The, it sounds like you learned about the diagnosis because before a race, you go for a physical and they picked it up during a pre-race physical. Yeah. So it was just a normal thing. I, I've, I've always done um, before an international race or a big race. I'll just go for a checkup, make sure everything's working, all the joints are oil, that kind of thing. And um, for Costa Rica, we had to go for yellow fever injections, you know, for the for the environment we're going into. And um, I went for the yellow fever injection about three or four days prior. And I went to my doc and I said to my doc, um, you know, I'm feeling a bit off. Um, and there's a like a, I had a bit of a bump on the back of my neck. And so she just stock standard for her as well. She just pulled blood as she does. And then... Um, we were about two and a half weeks away from from leaving for Costa Rica. And my doctor phoned me two days after pulling blood. She said, I need to come and see her. So I went back and saw her and she pulled blood again. And I went I went off and then she phoned me like, before the end of the day, I need to come in. I said, doc, what's going on? You know, I need to, no, I must come see her. And I'm ready for all champs. I'm in the best shape of my life. I mean, I'm good to go. I'm not feeling... I felt a bit fatigued. I was tired, but I just put that down to the training. And um, yeah, the markers are there. So she sent me from there immediately to go and have um, a sonar on my spleen, which was um, an indicator for the type of leukemia it was. And then um, the spleen was enlarged. And from there, they went straight for bone marrow extraction. And that's terrible. But um, but my head, at, my head at that point, I wasn't thinking about anything I was thinking leukemia. I mean, people, you hear that word and, you know, people, people fear, fear cancer. I mean, that, that's, that's a fact. So, mm-hmm. and the guy that was, that was pulling the bone marrow from me, I was lying and I was biting onto the pillow while he was drilling into my, into my bone. And I still said to him, I said, um, will you be able to stitch me up? Because I'm leaving in two weeks. I'm going to go and race. We're racing world champs in Costa Rica. And he said to me, he said, I'm going to be honest with you, but he says, um, what I'm doing to you now, you know, Costa Rica. And this is just a formality. He says, I check the blood twice and the bugs there, you know? So driving back before I even first spoke to my wife, I ended up finding my team captain first, um, saying to him, this is what's gone down. We've got two weeks. You got to get another, get someone else in play, you know? So yeah, it was a, it was a total roller coaster ride that changed my whole way of thinking from going one second, you're thinking you're indestructible and you get faced minutes later, you get faced with your own mortality. And that just puts everything into place. Everything falls into perspective after that. And then and it's interesting too, like how you, well, for, it speaks to your personality, that fact that you contacted the t- your team captain, because getting a teammate within two weeks notice is difficult for anybody. So you, you, you did that and you went through the cancer treatments and you worked with your family and then all of a sudden you, you, you have this, this valley you go into where you get this diagnosis, you hear cancer, many people fast forward to, to, to the ultimate end of what cancer could do to somebody. You go through the treatments and then talk to us about 2015. <laughs> it was, uh, it was quite an emotional thing for me. But um, so what happened was we went through the treatments and um, yes, my, my wife was my rock. She, she just, if anyone was strong going through this whole thing, it was her. I mean, she she didn't allow me to have any um, self doubt. You know, she was she was right there by my side. She, five years prior, to, she lost both her parents to cancer. So this whole thing was real. You know, we it, we we knew what it was. And um, Graham Bird, my captain at the time, he still drove down from Nasna to be there with me for my first uh, chemo and that sort of thing. And um, so we went through the whole stage came out of it so it was was no longer there and then the the oncologist that we're dealing with he said to me you know i should just keep moving you know don't don't stop what you're doing and uh, i've done that work with you know I had, a, I had a point to prove that um that this whole cancer can be beaten you know and going forward that race in swaziland um my team were adamant that uh, I was I was happy for to say to them, look, I'll sit out. You know, obviously, you know, get someone else in and wouldn't have it. And um, 
I just said to them, you know, I'm, I'm happy to race with them again on, on a very competitive level on condition that I don't get treated indifferently. Um, my job, my job at that time was the backup nav and the, um, and the donkey. So to say, to carry, carry heavy, the, the heavy packs, tow the guys. And, um, yeah, they, they allowed me to be, be who I am and be my person. And, um, and that for me, that I remember crossing the finish line and I, I just wept. It was just, it was, everything was just too much for me at that point. And then, um, and then of course, Pantanal, um, to be able to do world champs in 2015 uh, after that. And then it was just, uh, it was just something really special for me and be able to do it. So we had a, we had a win in Swaziland in 2015, then world champs Pantanal. Um, 2016, we placed second at the expedition. And then we went on to race um, 2016 in Australia, world champs in Australia. When I came back from that, um, my mom died, proved my point. I mean, I didn't, I had nothing more to prove to anyone. Um, I started doing what what the Merrill Adventure Addicts um, initiated something called um, the mentors, the mentors, Merrill mentors, and I became a mentor. So I was taking, I took beginners through and so on. And then, as I mentioned earlier, in 2018, I had this um, idea. In 2016, I bumped into an ex South African friend of mine, uh, Saki, living in New Zealand. He's had cancer and he's still racing now. Uh, him was chatting about saying how amazing it would be to get cancer survivors and go and do an expedition race, just show that people can, can survive this this horrible dreaded disease and come back and do something as hard as an adventure race, an expedition race. And he, he was planted then, and then I passed, I, met, I spoke to Merrill, having the Merrill Adventure Addicts racing and then having me get some cancer survivors to go through and do it. And um, they loved it, yeah, and they got on board, and that was, that was an emotional race. That was a special race. It was just, you know, the... All four of us were out there with for a major. You know, you you often hear people say, "I'm racing for a purpose." I'm racing for a reason, and that was just next level for us. It was very personal for us, all four of us. And, and that follows a very first things first. It's interesting. Adventure racers don't hesitate to to mentor new people. Um, you know, there's been a, a, a recently, and you could you could blame and credit Eco Challenge on Amazon Prime, and you could talk about the fact that it's a post COVID world there's been a, a big jump in adventure racing interest, especially here in America. And it's happening around the world. Adventure racing world series is just blossoming and blooming and credit to Heidi, the CEO, who's just really stewarding yeah. that organization. We don't hesitate for being welcoming to newer racers. We try our best to mentor people along, bring them along. Clearly your work with mentorship of racers, but also mentorship and bringing cancer survivors along has to be very, very powerful for you having gone through your journey. Do you think the adventure racing experience you had, how well did it prepare you for the journey of your cancer treatment? Like, did you apply a lot of those lessons from adventure racing into your, your, your chemotherapy and your recovery? Uh, it's funny you should ask that because um, that's often something that I, I do mention. Um, I do, you know, I, I've always got this never say die attitude. And I mentioned earlier how strong my wife was, the, the important role she played in, in, in my recovery and, and my journey through it. So, in an adventure racing team, you've got to, you've always got to have someone that you can lean on. You know, you've got to have someone as a crutch. And um, so my wife was my teammate going through this whole thing. So she was my crutch. She never once, she never once shed a tear with me. She never showed any any doubt that this is gonna, we're gonna beat this. I I know she, I'm obviously behind a closed door somewhere. She would have had her moments, but never showed me that weakness. Um, and never allowed me to have weakness. So um, as far as adventure racing with a cancer story, it was just a case of just 100% being positive, believing that, you know, we're going to get through this thing, not giving it a second thought and just doing whatever had to be done. My, I remember my, um, my oncologist saying to me before the chemo, he was saying to me, Don, I am very concerned about you going through the chemo because of who you are, you, you're an addict, you're addicted to um, endorphins and you're not going to do as you're told and you're probably, gonna, you're probably not going to make it. And I, I got a bit of a shock when he told me that <laughs> because I looked at him. Thanks, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, it's a bit of reverse psychology. I, I see it now. But um, I just said to him, I said, I said, I've got so much to live for. I've got a, I've got a young daughter that's still at school. 
Um, you know, I need to walk it on the aisle one day. Um, I need to do all these. I've got so much to live for. I said, you tell me what I need to do and I will do exactly that. And it's the same as an adventure racing team. You've got your navigator, you've got your captain. He's telling you what to do. As long as you're following it and doing it and we're sticking by the guidelines and you've got your, you got your strength and your support in your team, we can do anything, man. Anything can be done. Fantastic. Fantastic stuff and very powerful. I know that our audience will, will, will appreciate that. So thank you for being so honest and sharing about your, your cancer journey and giving the, the appropriate credit to your wife. I can relate to that. The fact that very often our wives are the rocks in these situations. Um, Absolutely, so, yeah. so, so you got a race coming up in a few weeks. You have the, the 10th anniversary of Expedition Africa. Uh, they're going to be in Lesotho. Um, how are you feeling about that? What's your, what's your prediction for the race? Oh, man, we are so excited for so what's happened is um, there are four of us that have done all nine Expedition Africas thus far. And um, so Stefan and Heidi spoke to us and the four of us, the four guys, we're all really good mates. Three of us live in the same town here in, in South Africa. And um, so Stefan and them said, look, if we get together as a team and it'll be an unofficial team, but it's a, we, we're racing as the four guys. We've called ourselves the originals because we've been from the original race. And um, so we're racing four guys. I'm looking so forward to it. It's going to be an absolute blast. We've got four good mates racing together. And um, I think Lesotho, out of all the expedition Africa so far, is going to be the race um, as far as difficulty level, as far as expedition style racing. There's, there's no, there's nothing in Lesotho. You know, it's, it's primal. It's real. There's no, um, you're not going to be on a bicycle and problem with it, with your bike and think I'll stop at the next bike shop and, um, we'll, we'll rectify it. There is no bike shop, you know, so yeah, I've heard it's going to be a really be, remote um, race. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so we've actually got with us now, we've gone bigger backpacks. We to, to accommodate more, more kit, um, carrying bike spares, all that sort of stuff. We, we, we really looking forward to it. And this, the four of us that are in the team, um, for us that, you know, the, the tougher, the better bring on the bad weather, bring on all everything for, it just makes it all, all the worthwhile, more worthwhile. So the, tell us a bit about the, the terrain. Obviously it's in, it's in, it's in Southern part of Africa. Is it, green is it desert is it water like what is the what what are your primary challenges are you going to be wet all the time is it is it warm is it cold or is it the whole package are you going to get everything it, it's it's really going to be everything so we're racing a lot of altitude um a, a large part of the race will be above 2000 meters up to i think off the top mate i think stefan mentioned we're going to be knocking around maybe three three and a half thousand meters at some places it's going to be we're expecting to be extremely cold um the, the weather conditions up there, the winds up there are, are ridiculous. The, there's mountains that we, we, we do a race called the War Trail. It's close-ish to where we are racing. It's on the border of Lesotho. And um, we just did a, did a War Trail race uh, a month and a half ago. And conditions the clean out there thinking we're going to have a hot race. You have to have all your safety. you got to carry it all because you use everything. And we've had a massive rainfall this year in South Africa. So um, I'm expecting it to be a very wet race, not just on the paddling legs, obviously, but the hiking legs, the, the cycling, we're going to, there's going to be mud. It's just going to be, it, it's our kind of race. You know, it's yeah. going to be tough. It's going to be yeah. our, our kind of thing. That's right. So it's your kind of race. So what yeah. makes it your kind of race? The, the, the wet combined with the cold and the physical toughness involved or the fact that it's the distance, like that's an interesting statement to make that it's your kind of race. Yeah. For us, when I'm saying I'm referring to my team, Mm -hmm. And for our kind of race, it's the tougher, the better, because um, we're not going to be a fast team, but we're going to be an experienced team that's going to be hopefully moving the right direction all the time. So like I said earlier, you know, the conditions are going to be hard. The conditions are going to be tough. It's what we need for us to have a, for us to have a good race. It's what we need. If, um, if it's going to be breezy and nice and wonderful, every, these, these guys can come out and race it flat out and we weren't, we're not going to stand a chance, but yeah. The tougher the, the tough and the there. slow fast is going to be better. Guys, your strategy there is that you want this course to wear teams down. This is going to be a race of attrition, right? Cold yeah. and wet and beat up, and you want them to to kind of come apart at the seams a little bit. And your team is tough with your nine previous races. You have the 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 muscle memory to kind of hold it together when it gets really hard. Yeah, yeah we're not going to we, we we will certainly not be in the top uh, top half of the race 
by day two. But as the as the conditions get longer and tougher and harder, I think we're going to get stronger and better and stronger. Gotcha. I think that's going to work in our favor. Which which brings up an interesting point we always mention to new newer racers. During the race itself, pay as little attention as possible to other teams. Learn that you need to race the course and not the other teams. That is when you're going to start having better results. Um, it's all about race the course and not not uh, pushing yourself to try and keep up to another team. It doesn't doesn't work. Right. Yeah. And also too is in, and very often you may go hours and hours and hours never seeing another team. Don't think you're in last place. But but that, that that's the part of adventure racing that I love so much is the remoteness. Being out there, you and your three mates. That, they are the most, at that point in your life, those three people around you are the most important people in your life because, you know, if something happens, they're going to save your life. They, they, you, that is who you're depending on for that time. So, again, the points we made earlier, racing with people that you can spend time with and deal with and be with is vitally important. Team dynamics is is probably the um, a cornerstone to be any successful team out there at the moment. You you look at the top teams. You look at team, um, uh, well Seagate. They're not Seagate anymore. Oh, yeah. Nathan Nathan Farley and them. Mm-hmm. You look at how many years of racing they've come through together. Um, I'm sure I'm sure they they know what what the their teammates thinking before they even that person even knows what he's thinking. You know you need to be able to recognize. So when when the Merrill Adventure Addicts were really racing well and doing well together. Um, we were not only racing the big races together, we were racing the small races together. We were spending weekends together, training camps together. It was just a case of knowing what my teammate is going to need. You know, you need to recognize when they're dropping off into that, um, into that dark zone, you need to pick them up before they get too down, too far down. You make sure they're eating, make sure they're drinking. Right. Right. And it's also good to point out, you mentioned the eating and the drinking, that in a race itself, when things begin to get a little dark and a little ugly, it's amazing how good hydration, a good bite, a good bite to eat, you bounce back. Like there is an in-race recovery. Especially in the beginning, when um, when the guys are still learning uh, to recognize their bodies and to recognize what they're going through. For a simple example, um, you're going along and you suddenly start getting headaches. That's an early sign of I'm dehydrated. You, I'm not drinking enough. I need to be putting more fluids in. As you start racing more, you recognize this on so much quicker. And, um, and then that just makes life a lot easier. And so what I was doing when drawing, um, I had a little um, alarm on, on my watch. It would go off every 45 minutes. And I'd be saying to the guys, are you drinking? Are you eating? And um, sometimes they, they're so caught up in what's happening around them. They forget to eat and drink. And right. then they look three hours in and they haven't drunk anything. And they start to spiral downwards. And that's, that's the problem. And once you go down that hole, it's start to come back out of it. Yeah, very, very difficult. Yeah, especially if you're still moving. You know, if, if you're in a situation where you can stop and eat, drink, and sleep, you will bounce back within two, three hours. But to continuously keep moving and eat enough while you're doing that and come back, that, that what you're going through could go on for six, seven hours. And it gets harder on a bigger race where you're three, four, five days in, you're just tired of eating. Yeah. Like it's tough. It gets hard to put food down. That's why it's nice to to come across like some sort of a, a shop or a cafe or a restaurant and get something brand new to eat. That's not in your pack. Like psychologically, that's a huge lift. So, so what we also do, I mean, when we pack our, our trail food, so as a, as a team food to go into our resupply boxes, we'll go, we'll arrive at, at the race or on the way to a race and we'll stop and we do a big shop and we'll buy wraps and the kind of stuff that we're going to put in our food boxes. But when it comes to our snacks and our trail food, that we do on our own. So when you are at that point where you're day three or day four in and you're sick and tired of eating what you've been eating, you look in your, your mate's race pack. What have you got? You know, you might have something different, something sour or something savory or something that you that you could see yourself getting down. So it's, you know, you eat off each other as well. Yeah, as and that's interesting. Eating, I've heard that before. What, what's your favorite food? Anything my teammate owns. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> On day three, yeah, whatever he's got. Well, l- listen, Donovan, this has been <clears throat> a fantastic interview. I appreciate you coming on the dark zone. Um, clearly wealth of knowledge. Uh, uh, you know so much about the sport. We're going to have you back again. We, we're going to talk to you after Expedition Africa to hear how the race went. Um, are there any closing thoughts? A lot of the listeners of the dark zone are newer racers. What do you want to say to them directly uh, about their, their racing and their growth in the sport? Racing is endurance, it's persistence, it's tenacity. Got to go for 30 hours. I was lost for 30 hours. 
but I just love being out there. So you've got to learn. Don't don't come to a race and you know, your first two, three races, you're not making the cutoff. You're not getting to the finish line. You know, don't stop because it. the more you do it, the easier it gets. It's like that with anything. The more you practice, the better you get. So as a beginner racer, um, I know it's always difficult to find a navigator, a navigator, a good navigator that's going to get you checkpoint to checkpoint. That's It's a... Uh, it's a, it's a myth. We spoke earlier about um, top teams getting lost and so on in races. We call it the perfect race where you nail everything. Uh, that's that's like a it's a fairy tale. You know you're gonna make a mistake somewhere. So as a beginner, don't don't lose hope, don't lose heart because you're not getting to the end line. Just love love doing what you're doing while you're doing it. Find find the find your happy space and just keep moving, man. Um, it does get does get better. It's an amazing sport. There's nothing. Nothing out there that comes close to adventure racing. I mean, I mean, the guys that are doing it are still doing it. I've got friends of mine that are 60 years old and still doing it. So, you know, there's there's no such thing as too old or too young. You know, we can start whenever you and finish when you feel like finishing. There's no, there, there's no, there's no rules to this. You know, it's it's uh, it's uncapped. It's perfect. If you have enjoyed this episode, please pay a visit to your podcast streaming platform of choice and leave us a review. That is the best way to spread the word. And always feel free to reach out to me, Brian, at ardarkzone.com. Your feedback and guest suggestions are always welcome. Thank you, listeners, for joining us at The Dark Zone. Have fun out there.